welcome back everybody we are boys on film my name is phil i'm sat next to raj well kind of web canny sat next to raj and also sean welcome back boys hey phil <laughs> so we're talking about femme today um an erotic neo-noir thriller revenge thriller uh, based on the shorts that we saw a couple of years ago, uh, which was Beef winning and BAFTA nominated, should have won, in my opinion. That was the same name, Femme. Same writers and directors. So, it's written and directed by Sam H. Freeman and Ung Chun Ping. Raj, we saw the short, but you didn't, Sean. I didn't, but I do recall both of you raving about it massively. Oh and as a short film queen, yeah, shocked that I didn't see it. I remember I saw this film, the short in at South by Southwest like two years ago, and it wasn't even one that I watched like at the festival. It was just on the player afterwards, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, festival's over. Let's go through. Let's go through the shorts. Blah blah. blah. And I watched them, and I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. It was definitely like the best short of the year. Yeah. And to no surprise, it hit the news that it was being made into a full-length feature film. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. Definitely deserve it. But I think there's a lot to unpack today comparing the uh, feature film to the short. So Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. Because, I mean, there are differences. Obviously, it's written by and directed by the same people. But the cast are different. We had Harris Dickinson, your favourite Raj, who was in the short. He played Wes. Uh, Love and me Papa, some first consent. Yeah. <laughs> Papa Esadeu was in the short, right? Papa Esadeu, yeah, he was, he played Jordan, so he played the protagonist, um, but obviously it is, uh, you know, central roles for both those two characters, both those actors, but we've got George McKay, who is in this movie, in the feature, and also Nathan Stewart Jarrett, who was in Misfits. He's been in a lot of things, actually, the last couple of years. He's, he's a bit of a, bit of a favourite, isn't he, at the moment? The star is rising, definitely. Yeah. I don't I don't know, but after this, you know, I kind of was like, oh, it's not Harris Dickinson. But I don't know, after watching George McKay, I kind of feel like he delivered something a little extra that maybe Harrison might have taken a risk on. So I was quite impressed with, I know who George McKay is now. So, you know, that's always the question, you know, who are you until you have that one sort of pivotal role that will change it for you. And for me, that was definitely it. I like George McKay. I think he's... A very versatile actor because he was in 1917. Yeah, and I thought he was amazing in 1917. And then to play such a different character in this, and again, I haven't seen the short film, but in this feature, I'm impressed. I think he's a star. I think he's got real versatility. However, you want to take the word versatility. He's very versatile. He's able to be really intense as well, which is what was needed for this role, I think, because it's quite a complex character. When you think about the story, I mean, we'll come on to that, obviously. But yeah, there's a lot going on, like Raj says. There's a lot to unpack. Um, the fact that the short was, I'm guessing, around 15, 20 minutes, but it delivered so much because there was a lot going on, a lot of intensity. I didn't feel the the anxiety so much with this, but I think that there is a reason for that because I think it it's, it's more exploring their relationship, isn't it, this film, rather than the short? Yeah, I mean, for people who haven't seen the short, it's going to feel like, what are they talking about? But the short just was like, it was really riveting and it sort of rocked you to the core, especially the ending. And so when watching this, I was kind of expecting like the same sort of scenes and the same sort of moments. But, but really the themes of the two are quite different. I think like Femme, the feature film that we're talking about, it's more about power dynamics and, you know, power exchange, you know, gender roles, that sort of thing, which is really interesting. It's an interesting direction to take it, whereas, you know, the short was just like survival, you know, and in a moment where, you know, you've basically got a gun to your head. So um, I was kind of expecting that same sort of intensity, but I got it just in a little bit more emotive feelings you know and going through their relationship and how sort of everything turns and they're both at the end kind of feeling the same trauma that you know kicks off the whole story Mm. so let's talk about that story yeah without spoiling too much so it's set in the uk i think london is it fair to say london i'm guessing so yeah it felt kind of shoreditchy didn't it that area looked i felt like it was Manchester. actually they don't give that away do they i thought it was manchester Wrong. Oh, that's a good point, Raj, because that's why I was a bit like, it feels a bit like it could be like a Bethnal Green's working men's club kind of thing, but it could be anywhere. So it feels it's the UK, um, follows the story of Jules, who is this very kind of like out and proud, 
very fierce individual who performs at the club. But he steps outside and he sees this guy across the street who is kind of like handsome and giving him the eye. That unfortunately leads to a homophobic, quite a brutal homophobic, homophobic attack that kind of leaves Jules reeling about um, who he is as an individual and a person. Fast forward a few days and Jules finds himself in a sauna all been there and um the attacker preston happens to also be in the sauna and that's really where the story begins in in a and it goes through many different lenses and i'd like to talk about this today like some of it feels like revenge porn some of it feels like redemption some of it feels like you know just a pure on attack um but i'd like to talk about that but really how that how their relationship and i say relationship in inverted commas plays out over the course of the film yeah, I was going to ask you both, because um, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable with revenge thrillers. I've seen a lot, but I think they're very entertaining, but they always do make me feel a bit uneasy because you're kind of going through these scenes where somebody's obviously being violent about, <laughs> against somebody else, and you just think to yourself, that's not the best kind of action. It's not the wisest kind of action, but it does make great viewing. I mean, it does make a tense thriller. Jules kind of, you know, he flirted with danger. He's definitely flirting with danger. And maybe that was a whole, you know, part of the, you know, erotic thriller of it is, you know, yeah, that guy, I hate that guy, but, I, you know, I also want to get to know him and see what makes him tick. And maybe I want to get revenge. Maybe I want to be in a relationship. Maybe I want to play with, play, you know, with his head a little bit. And, you know, I found the whole thing just very psychological and kind of chilling, you know, especially when they exchange the same verbiage that, you know, Preston used on him in the attack. Like, I was just like, I felt chills run down my spine. It was crazy. Yeah, because George McKay's character obviously is closeted because when, when he's with his friends, he's very... He's, it's that whole toxic masculinity thing, isn't it? He's trying to pretend to be somebody that he's not. And obviously Jules knows that they've had this relationship so he knows that he's obviously gay or maybe bisexual it's an interesting one isn't it because it's a film but i do think it it has the opportunity to really delve into some of these topics you know because um you're right raj jules does he's playing a very racy game here a very dangerous game it explores you know preston's role yes he's in the closet Yes, it explores int interesting terms around masculinity and around when men, why men attack, and often they f they attack when they feel that their masculinity has been threatened, and that's what we f we see early on in the in the film when Jules kind of teases him, um, and then there's there's roles about dominance, you know, there's kind of master servant kind of particular angle that that Preston plays through, which we again we realise isn't really the case. Then there is just pure venom, you know. Revenge is a cup, in this case, served scolding heart, and how that plays out. And so, really, what you see is um, two individuals where the outcome is never going to work because there's no space or perspective. Jules, in some ways, isolates himself from the people around them who would probably say, Hold on, this has gone too far. So, what you see is Jules remove himself from his friend group and then go on this kind of like, I say, revenge track to get redemption or retribution for an action. And in some ways, all of that is is never going to end in a good place because it lacks perspective. That does probably explain why the feature is quite different to the short. Because the short, I think, is more... I was going to say thrilling, but I don't think that's fair because I think this film is still thrilling. But I think it explores the relationship between the two main characters rather than just the the violent action or the revenge i think that's definitely part of it in the feature but i think it i think it it gives something a bit more interesting because there's more complexity with the story so i think obviously you know with a feature you've got to kind of put more story in because there's more there's more to deliver i suppose in a way with something that's longer but yeah i i still thought this was great but i never knew what to expect with this feature because i never knew where it was going yeah i kind of predetermined that Oh, I know! I know what's going to happen next. I know what's going to happen next, and oh, did that you? didn't. Happen. Oh, yeah! I was like, "There's a whole scene in the short, well, at the end, where you're just like, you know, that's a big pivotal moment." Uh, but and I was kind of waiting for that in the film, and it never arrived really. But what I have to say is that I found really interesting is that the more that like Preston's mates tore him down, and you know, uh, 
you know, knocked him off of, you know, a few pegs on the pedestal, you know, from, you know, playing the um, Street Fighter game to saying that, oh, he doesn't own his own car and he's actually not the boss man, his flatmate is. Like, the more and more that his, he got talked down to and he got, you know, pushed down to, like, the more vulnerable he became and intertwining that with his sexuality and his relationship with Jules, like, it was just really fascinating to watch. Like there was a couple of times I laughed out loud and there was a couple of times I'm like, Oh my God, my hairs are standing up on, on my arms, you know? So I don't know. This film definitely can move you. It, you know, when it makes you stop and really think about those situations that, you know, that we've probably have been in before, but, you know, not necessarily been able to get out of so easily. Like, you know, the character, Jules character did an amazing job and how he's just able to fake, like, you know, being one of those guys and really playing with fire. Like not everyone can pull that off. So you kind of have to ask yourself too, like, who is the villain here, you know? But in the end, they're all gonna go through the same, same trauma. Yeah, you're absolutely right because I think that's what what you ask yourself with revenge thrillers or horrors, you know, other others that you've seen. I think you do ask that question, and I think with this, it's not as easy to define because you're kind of siding with both people. Yeah, in classic gay cinema, you're all, you know, we as queer viewers are going to automatically, you know, side with Jules, homophobic attack, you know, uh, lost his identity. We've all been through that, but. You know, now, like, queer cinema has come so far that we can ask ourselves, like, hmm, maybe George isn't, (laughs) isn't, you know, just the, uh, the enemy here. He's kind of a victim as well. I know he did some really terrible things, but understanding toxic masculinity and how it shapes, you know, our lives as, you know, the male species are kind of like, yeah, he kind of went through some shit too. So, and you're not supposed to like, you know, like him or even side with him. But in the end, I was just like, I kind of see both characters very equally. We anchor the whole story around Jules and Jules' retribution, but you could turn the whole film around and you could anchor the whole thing around Preston as someone who is in the closet, does not have the right language or mechanisms to describe their feelings or emotions, lashes out at somebody but really wants to explore their sexuality. So I get it. Yeah, you're right. There's a, there's a binary simplistic way to say Jules is, Jules is, um, Jules is the victim and they are, but actually they're both victims of a situation. Um, And I think that's interesting to play with. There was a couple of ideas that I want to test with you, which is did Preston really not know who Jules is or was Preston also equally dicing with danger? So we, we talk a lot about Jules dicing with danger saying, Oh, I'm going to enter this situation. But what if, Preston was also doing the same thing. He's also dicing with danger because he knows that there's this really kind of flamboyant, very um, pro-queer person that he's attracted to. And he's also doing that. I don't know the answer. I definitely think he was playing with danger from the minute he was just standing outside to the club to, you know, even entering a gay sauna. He was definitely playing with danger. Now you ask, what did he know, you know, who the drag queen was versus... Jules. That I don't know because I think there's a there's a point in the film where he did put it together when he saw his wardrobe and everything. Yeah, uh, but it wasn't. I don't think it was till the end that he really got it and understood that you know that was him. But I think I find that's interesting because I think they're both they're both dicing with situations that they're uncomfortable in, and we kind of again lean on Jules going here they are surrounded by all these guys, toxic masculinity, really uncomfortable situation. This could go horribly wrong. But you also have Preston, as you say, um, Raj, outside a queer space, clearly curious, doesn't know how to play it. For him, that's equally scary uh, and equally, like, you know, daunting. But again, the angle of the film is through the lens of Jules, but I think it's clever in that way because it makes us think a lot about Preston. That sauna scene, though, I I was like this, because the sauna scene is obviously Jules being you know like Raj says seeking out danger and and getting that thrill of that danger going up to the locker when he's obviously getting changed and leaving and I just thought to myself no don't be like just ignore him he'll go away but he doesn't he he goes right up to him and obviously it was almost like face off in a way wasn't it even like you know Preston giving him all the warning signs like don't with me 
don't f with me. And there's a scene where he's filming something and you're just like, Jules, you are just asking for punishment. Even yeah. Preston said, you're a glutton for punishment. You keep coming back for more, more abuse, really. So why you keep pushing the buttons? I was so, so mad when they did the hookup and they you know, went out to the forest or whatever. And like, Preston just left him there. I was so pissed. I was like, <laughs> if you go back after that, you are you are definitely you know something might be a little missing in your in your uh, self awareness because if someone ever did that to me, I would never speak to them again. But is there? But is there role play there, Raj? Yes, because that's what oh, I think cool. about. 100%. Of course, there is. We know that I... there's a power dynamic that. Preston is leaning into in this situation. He's signposted it all the way through. And in a way, he's just like, it's that kind of like master sub relationship, which is like, you're nothing to me. And he's playing with the angle. And he's kind of saying to Jules throughout it, this is what you want, isn't it? This is what yeah. you want. Yeah. He's signposting their relationship. It's, you're right, Raj, on a, when, you, when you pan out, it's kind of horrible and gross and disgusting. But, but I think the table's turned though. Playing with. I, I think agree. the table's turned because Joel, Jules almost does what he starts off, what Preston starts off doing, because he, it's almost like the power does flip round because he's, I guess, wanting to know why he attacked him. So he's wanting to find out why he's that kind of person when obviously he's attracted to him. So he wants to know why he's, I guess, because he's in the closet and that's his way of dealing with it. Obviously, it's the wrong way. But I, I guess Jules, Jules just wants answers. So he goes to any lengths to get answers, to find out who he is. And he gets some of that, because actually the friend group signpost it. The friend group say, you know, you, we really wind him up and then he just goes. So he gets some signposting and, and they telegraph, I guess, why that's the case, which I think is interesting. I also think, you know, when he changes the way that he dresses, that was interesting because it's almost another form of drag, as we always talk about. He born naked and the rest is drag. Even like when he starts to masquerade as something else, it is, I think, a form of drag because he's like, I'm just dressing up as something and I'm pretending yeah. to be something else. So I found yeah. that super interesting. My, my point about the friend group, which I found, which I was intrigued about and I thought we wanted to be explored was the his closest friend kept saying, oh, he should have told us he had a boy around, which language like that is actually quite queer language. And I don't know whether the friend is signposting that he knows Preston's gay. He even said, like, oh, Preston's probably trying to seduce you, Jules. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But, like, never a truer word said in jest, because when they're in that situation, I think the friends are kind of signposting something. But you're right, Preston doesn't have the language to acknowledge it. So he's just like, whatever. But when you listen to what the friend group is saying, they, first of all, don't dismiss jewels from the group actually once they realize you know he likes street fighter they have a common they have a common ground that they can work towards and then they all go out and have a great time and actually it's from that situation that jewels loses his power because preston sees the vulnerability the story yeah where he, he is in the pecking order of his friends etc and suddenly that role play that 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 like master sub role play diminishes because Jules can see right through it, and that's when it pivots. So I, I thought there was a lot of interesting play in there that I'm not saying it should have been explored, but it's kind of on the table to to, to, to discuss. I thought it was really interesting how he did become, his Preston's character did become more vulnerable towards the end, which does make you feel, as a viewer, more sympathetic towards his character, which was clever because ultimately we don't agree with what he's done in the first half of the film. So you kind of don't really want to side with him. You don't want to have that feeling towards Preston's character, but it's good that you do have that as the film goes on. How brilliant is the analogy of the Street Fighter video game with Shin Lee beating the shit out of like, <laughs> like, and then like everyone just gagging for it and living for it and, you know, accepting Jules and their friend group because his drag character in Street Fighter is, you know, a bad bitch. So <laughs> I think... It's totally, it's totally mega. I mean, I would always pick Chun Li. So fierce. That could be for another video, maybe. That's we another, can discuss that, that more. I, I think there's that amazing quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which says, "You intelligence is being able to hold two opposing thoughts in your head," and that's what I get from this film. I have a do I? <laughs> I am a hundred percent against the homo homophobic attacks. I'm not yeah. justifying any of that. No. So, 
there's an and rather than an or, and the and is what is Preston's story. The film does a really good job of holding these two opposing thoughts in our heads and us playing with both of it. And so that sympathy that comes through for Preston is also okay. It, it doesn't diminish how we feel about the homophobic attack. No, it, but isn't that great? Um, because you could they could explore that in, in a sequel. So that could be really interesting plot-wise. That That's a great story in itself, isn't it? More uh, an exploration of Preston's character and why he got there in the first place. We could have a whole fan universe where the short film is intertwined with the feature film, which is intertwined yeah a tv show like like i'm such fans of these directors now like i just want to see what they do next and yeah me too if they play their cards right they could have like a new queers folk you know level phenomenon um and i would i would live for it i'm here for it let's mm-hmm. let's bring on let's bring on femme the tv show like give give me everything Oh my god, there's so much room for it. I think there's there's definitely options that they could explore. And yeah, I'm here for it as well. So star rating then, guys. For Femme, the feature, which is out on the 1st of December in cinemas. For me, five. Wow, five stars. Yeah. Wow. Definitely. It's four for me. I loved it. I, I loved it as much as the short, but I think they're very different pieces of work. But I'm glad that they are because they both explore different things. Sean Vickers? Oh my god. I think, okay, I think I was a four, but I now think I'm a three. Oh, across the board here. Intriguing. Because I think the more I think about this interplay of the two characters, I think it could have been explored more. And I've done a lot of thinking behind the scenes and you two have done a lot of thinking behind the scenes. Maybe that's okay. Maybe the role is that we go away and we think about it. Sean, did it need 20 more minutes? You don't need <laughs> yeah. 20 more minutes. Nothing needs 20 more minutes, bro. <laughs> no, not, and certainly not this review. I think this. I think there's something on the table that's not been... My thing is there's more on the table that could have been... But that's explored. a good thing. Less is more sometimes, right? No, of course. And I get that. So... Yeah, like maybe, 20 minutes you know less what? is I'll, more. I'll get four, four, <laughs> four. But I've got... I'm below four. I was going to say you're a strong three, maybe. But strong yeah, three, I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're going for the four because they deserve it, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, but you know where I'm coming from? I think there's something that this film could have taken it ever so slightly further, but it's really fab. Yeah. But mm, mm. I just want to okay. quickly mention the music because the music's composed by Adam Janota Bozowski, who did uh, St. Maud's soundtrack. Mm. And we love St. Maud. Mm. So, yeah, that I just wanted the, to mention the great music in this because it does make you feel horrors- very clammy. Hands are clammy. Yeah. Yeah, okay, four, four, it's a four, it's a four. Fabulous. So it's called Femme. It is out in cinemas on the 1st of December. Guys, always great, great to see you. Thank you everyone for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, check out the video that's on the screen now somewhere, floating around our heads. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, Phil. Cheers, <laughs> Rob. Bye, everyone.